This is David Bergantino, author of the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror series. You're listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian's audiobook presentation of Virtual Terror. Keep it scary out there. Hey Slashaholics, this is the 80s Slasher Librarian. Be sure to check out and join the Facebook group page, follow the channel on Twitter and Instagram, and also check out the merch store and the Patreon page. Uh, the links to all of these are in the description below. Uh, just let you know, I depend on horror fans like you to keep this channel going and growing for years to come. Cannot monetize the channel due to the content and the copyrights surrounding it. So the Patreon is what keeps the channel funded. You can sign up and support the channel for as low as $2 per month. You get some great rewards depending on the tier you select. You get early access to certain content. A weekly exclusive podcast only on Patreon. You can also voice characters and audiobook narrations. You can get free merch, free ebooks, and so much more. Check out the Patreon page and sign up today for as low as two bucks. Really use your support, and you'll be helping this channel keep going and growing for a long time to come. Tonight's upload is brought to you by the patrons of this channel. I'd like to take time to say thank you to Sean McAllister, Jay Cutemaker, Tony DeVore, Simonoli, Tyrone Kennard, Nick Velkov, Jeffrey Quick, Daniel Mackey, David Arnold, Alex Vanover, Krista Campbell, Rob Davey, Jay Gardner, Willow Ravenwood, Lauren Vaught, Kristen Kay, Michael, William Schaefer, Liam Anderson, Bonanza Jellybean, Bree, Ryan Woodward, Allison Seib, Iron Alexa, Hawaii, Cecilia Spears, Sean Campbell, Catherine McClear, and Carl Eakins. Thank you so much for supporting the channel on Patreon. I could not do this channel without you. And now enjoy tonight's installment of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Virtual Terror, by David Bergantino. Red right hand You'll see him in your nightmares You'll see him in your dreams He'll appear out of nowhere But he's not what he seems You'll see him in your head And on the TV screen Hey buddy, I'm warning you to turn it off He's a ghost, he's a god He's a man, he's a guru Chapter 3 Keith ran to the phone and pressed the speaker button with a finger from his good hand. Without listening for a dial tone, he hit the auto-dial button for Mario's number. A joyless female voice answered. Mario's aunt. Hi, Mrs. Vasquez, it's Keith. He tried to speak normally, but it was difficult through clenched teeth. Is Mario there? He's studying right now, Keith, she told him quietly. He'll call you when he's through. His aunt was a strict disciplinarian who insisted on set times for homework. But she was fair, rewarding Mario's hard work with the freedom to do as he pleased when he was finished studying. Could I please speak to him now? He asked, knowing she would be shocked by his insistence. I wouldn't ask, but I just smashed my hand with a hammer, and my mom's not home. I may need to go to the hospital. Mrs. Vasquez was silent on the other end, as if trying to calculate if this was an adolescent ploy or the truth. I'll get him, she said. Even if she believed him, her annoyance was obvious nonetheless. Hey, you hurt yourself, dude? Mario asked when he came to the phone. I think I broke my hand. Uh, will you come drive me to the emergency? I can't move it. Broke your hand? How'd you do that? Mario sounded more amazed than concerned. I'll tell you on the way, Kevin said impatiently. Will you just get over here? I'll be right there, Mario said quickly and hung up. Hours later, Keith and Mario were leaving the emergency room. 
Keith's left hand was set in a stiff plastic cuff to prevent movement. Lucky you didn't break it, Mario said as he unlocked the car. Yeah, Keith answered quietly. The black circle had turned out to be carbon from the face of the hammerhead. The crunching sound had simply been Keith's knuckles cracking. But the bruise was serious and the doctor said the hand would have to remain immobile for at least a week. That meant no wrestling and there was a big match in a few days. Thinking about the Westview match? Mario asked as he climbed into the car. Yeah. Well, at least you didn't get hurt. Mario, that'd be a real problem. The rivalry between Springwood and Westview was strong. For ten years, their overall records had been nearly even, but it was Mario who had tipped the balance of power squarely in Springwood's favor. With him on the team, Westview couldn't touch them. Like it's not a problem you're going to be out? Mario asked rhetorically. You're the captain, dude. You get the team motivated. I can do that from the sidelines, Keith pointed out, but you'd be no help on the sidelines. Yeah, that's true, Mario agreed, but they both knew that it was actually Mario who motivated the team now. He could have been captain this year if he'd wanted to, but out of de deference to Keith, he'd never pursued the position. Considering that less than a year ago, Mario had been afraid to wrestle, things had turned out quite differently than Keith would have expected. Mario had started at Springwood at the beginning of the prior school year. His father had sent him to live with his aunt in the suburbs to get him away from the gangs and urban violence. But Mario was still somewhat tainted by the area in which he'd grown up. More than a little rough around the edges, he was a textbook fish out of water. But a piranha. Because he was new, troubled, and tough, he had gotten into frequent fights. Several weeks after his arrival, Mario and another student were on the verge of a serious fistfight at lunch. Keith happened to be nearby and managed to defuse the situation with his peculiar sense of humor. Mario had never experienced anything like it before. Where he came from, no one cracked jokes. They only cracked heads. Mystified, Mario had asked Keith who he was. Keith introduced himself and shook Mario's hand. He then invited Mario to finish out the rest of the lunch period at his table. Bewildered, Mario followed him and the two talked. When Mario explained what he was doing in Springwood, Keith had laughed and told him he had come to the wrong place to avoid violence. Then he told Mario about Springwood's unsavory history, Freddy Krueger, his death at the hands of the Elm Street parents, and rumors that Freddy still lurked and killed in dreams. Mario had found the story unbelievable, but took Keith seriously. Don't worry, Keith said to reassure him. They're really just a lot of rumors, but you should be aware, an awful lot of people, kids mostly, die around here. After that, the two became close friends. The chip on Mario's shoulder quickly wore away, and he focused his energies on athletics. He took to weightlifting. Then, Keith invited him to join the wrestling team. Mario refused at first, without explanation. Then, hounded by Keith, he finally explained that he was claustrophobic. He couldn't stand to be pinned. He'd go nuts, he claimed. Fine, said Keith, just don't get pinned. So Mario joined. And somehow Mario had managed to follow Keith's advice. During the entire wrestling season, no opponent had pinned him. The few times it nearly happened, Mario had exploded in a burst of almost maniacal energy, quickly turned the tables and won the match. Mario had told the truth. He truly was claustrophobic. No matter how close they became, Mario offered little information about his previous life. If pressed, he would admit that it had been bad. Really bad. But he would say no more than that. Keith guessed that Mario had not exercised the demons of his inner city life so much as imprisoned them within himself, only to let them out at crucial moments to do his bidding. When he wrestled, for example. Sometimes Keith wondered what would happen if Mario lost control of the demons. By the way, Keith said, I'm really sorry about what I said to Carrie today. Sometimes you're too clever for your own good, but don't apologize to me, dude. You can call Carrie yourself. I will, a and another thing. I thought maybe... Keith hesitated. He couldn't believe he was actually going to ask this. We could double date, you and Carrie and me and Pam. Mario pulled into Keith's driveway and shut off the engine. You sure about that? I mean, it'd be fine with me, and I think Kiri would go for it, but 
You know, it's your party. Keith suddenly realized how delicately his friend had been treating him for the past six months. It was pathetic. He felt pathetic. Mario's reaction gave Keith the sense that they had been waiting for this moment for a long time. Even Carrie, it seemed. Now he was sure this was the right thing to do. It's not my party anymore, he said confidently. Wallowing, been there, done that. Ready to move on. All right, Mario yelled. He raised his hand for a vigorous high five. Keith raised his good hand tentatively. Gentle, this is my last one. Mario laughed and lightly smacked his hand. You gonna be okay tonight? Need anything else? No, I'll talk to you tomorrow. He got out of the car and then walked around to the driver's side. Thanks a lot. Not a problem, Mario said, waving as he pulled out of the driveway. The kitchen clock read 10.15. He had been at the emergency room for almost four hours. The house was empty. There was no sign that his mother had been home since he'd left. If she had, she hadn't noticed he was missing. They were like the lizard and the bird on the Galapagos Islands that shared the same nest but rarely occupied it at the same time. And of course, he had no father who might be concerned about him. He sighed. There was another kind of pain that had not yet gone away. He absently rubbed the plastic brace as he checked the refrigerator door. A single square of fluorescent pink paper was held there by a magnet. Much to Keith's amazement, it read, Casserole. Normally, weekend dinners at Keith's house were informal affairs, if they happened at all. He had expected to find a note with the usual three large letters, FFY, which stood for Fin for Yourself. This appeared on days when Keith's mother would not have the time to prepare any dinner in between weekend meetings of the various clubs, societies, and organizations of which she was a member. FFY had appeared so frequently in recent months that Keith had had the note laminated. Inside the refrigerator, he found a reasonable rendition of a tuna casserole. He scooped some out onto a plate and stuck it into the microwave. A few electronic beeps later, and the food was heating for 45 seconds on high. 45 seconds, an infinitely longer time than it had taken for Keith's father to die. The man had been a sales executive. Exactly what kind of sales executive, and for whom, he had long since forgotten. It seemed irrelevant to Keith anyway. What was relevant was that Keith's father had been alive once and now was not. He had died in a car accident when Keith was three. Keith could still remember his father, though his mother did not believe him. It was a memory of a presence rather than an actual person, but Keith possessed that memory and guarded it. Keith's sadness and sense of loss over his father's death had grown slowly as Keith grew. At the time of the accident, he had been too young to understand exactly what had happened. His mother experienced an extended period of depression and withdrawal. Her outlook became perpetually bleak. She claimed to have lost the ability to feel. Then one day, her sadness abruptly vanished. She sprang back into life and quickly landed a job as an office manager for a local corporation. Soon, she had re-entered the social scene in earnest. Within three years, she had actually met someone wonderful, someone she planned to marry. At first, Keith had instinctively distrusted the man whose name was Terence Hopley. Terence did nothing wrong. On the contrary, he was very kind to Keith and his mother. But Keith had a feeling. After long talks with his mother and great effort on Terence's part, Keith grudgingly gave in and accepted the man who would replace his father. The microwave pinged and Keith removed his meal. He went to the table and began to eat, chewing slowly, thinking. Mysteriously, Terence had disappeared just before the wedding. He left behind a note that read simply, I cannot explain, but know that I love you always. And he signed it. Some of the ink was smudged as if Terence had been crying. Keith's mother was crushed. It was as if a husband had died all over again. Depression reasserted itself, 
but she had her job, and so the withdrawal was never quite complete, and the sadness didn't last as long. This time, however, she strenuously avoided wading back into the dangerous waters of dating. Instead, she turned her energies toward a variety of hobby and social service organizations. She was always quilting and volunteering and heading up projects, and with the exception of a few very brief and intentionally hopeless affairs with married men, she had never again actively sought meaningful companionship. So Keith had grown up without a father, and recently with an absentee mother. As Keith finished his meal, he remembered the time he had seen a photograph of Terence on the evening news. His general appearance had been altered, longer hair of a different color, glasses, etc., but the identity was unmistakable. The story had appeared several years after the disappearance of the man who apparently went by the name of Terence Hopley, Joseph Fishbuck, and dozens of others. He was reputed to have been a so-called thief of hearts. Apparently, he made a hobby of meeting women, usually widows, and wooing them until they accepted a marriage proposal. Then he would leave them standing at the altar. There was no financial gain involved. He did not swindle anyone out of money. According to the news report, his motive was simply to bring his victims to an emotional peak and then dash their hopes. Also, according to the report, he had been shot dead by a former lover who had succeeded in tracking him down. There's your karma right there, thought Keith. What goes around, comes around. Yes, sir, Bob. Keith left his dishes in the sink and went to bed. He had no idea when his mother would return, but wanted to be asleep long before that. He was in no mood to deal with her inevitable fussing when she saw his injury. Up in his room, Mysteria lay face down where it had fallen earlier. Keith picked it up carefully, expecting to find broken glass underneath it. To his surprise, the glass was not only unbroken, but the surface was completely unmarred. He couldn't even tell where the hammer had struck it. What luck, he thought. But then a wave of dread washed over him as he prepped the frame up against the wall. He let go of the poster, and the strange feeling lessened, but this time it did not disappear completely. A residue of fear seemed to cling to his mind. He tried to shake it off, but it remained as he dressed for bed. After he turned off the light, he felt the distinct sensation of being watched, and somehow the feeling came from the poster. He tried to ignore the crazy feeling, but it would not go away nor allow him to sleep. Finally, he got out of bed and flipped the picture so it faced the wall. He felt silly doing it, but he also felt better, less paranoid. Sleep came easily then, and with it, dreams. Chapter 4 Keith stood in the bright square of light and looked up towards its source. The skylight framed a picture of a perfect sunny weekend afternoon in Springwood. A rarity. And here I am at the mall, thought Keith, as usual. He looked back up at the blazing sun. A black sliver had begun to form on its right edge. Blackness grew like an infection, and soon the entire disk of the sun was eclipsed. The blue sky darkened. Day turned to night, and the eclipsed sun became a crescent moon. Storm clouds formed, blotting out the moon entirely. Fierce lightning clawed across the sky. Rain pelted the skylight like stones. Suddenly, a strong hand grasped Keith's arm and nearly yanked him off his feet. He yelped in pain. Stop frowning, dude, or I'll give you a reason to frown, croaked a harsh voice. Keith was roughly spun around and shaken for emphasis. Mario, a dangerous glint in his eye, held Keith firmly by the arm. Come on, the girls are waiting! He shoved Keith ahead of them, and the two began walking. From behind, there came a great crash and the sound of breaking glass. Keith stopped and turned. On the spot where he had stood a moment ago lay a large branch and hundreds of glass shards. Rain poured down through the smashed skylight. Mario pushed him forward again. You'll get worse if you don't hurry up, he barked. Dude, he added with disgust. Bewildered, Keith allowed himself to be herded to the yogurt stand. 
On the way, he noticed the mall was eerily deserted. Get us some yogurt, Mario ordered. They'll be here in a minute. Hey, what can I get you, man? Asked the yogurt store employee. It was Mel, looking more pallid than before. At first, Keith could only stare in blank surprise. Then he realized that Mel was waiting for an answer. Turning his attention to the yogurt dispensers, he saw four, labeled Carrie, Pam, Mario, and Keith, respectively. Uh, I'd like Carrie, please? He said shakily. Mel promptly dispensed some yogurt from the corresponding spout into a cone and handed it to Keith. Tentatively, Keith tasted the yogurt. It melted on his tongue. The most amazing taste he had ever experienced. He was about to devour the yogurt when Mario greedily snatched the cone out of his hand. That's mine! Get your own! With that, Mario ate the entire cone in three savage bites. Meekly, Keith turned back to Mel, who smiled as if nothing unusual were happening. Uh, I guess some Pam then? He requested. In a flash, Mel held out a second cone. The flavor of this yogurt was distinctively different, but just as good as the first. Again, however, Mario took the cone. That's mine too! Mario glared at Keith threateningly. Get. Your. Own! He emphasized each word, then wolfed down the cone. Keith had only two choices left, Keith and Mario. What do you recommend? He asked Mel. Mel winked and leaned across the counter toward him. Why don't you try some of Keith? Of course, it's not as flavorful as Mario, but it's okay. Carrie is sweeter and Pam is creamier, but you could do worse than Keith. Besides, I can give you a deal on it. He leaned closer and lowered his voice further. Between you and me, no one else will buy it, unless I'm out of the rest. But I think you'll like it just fine. Keith was about to order when Pam and Carrie appeared beside him. Mel instantly forgot about Keith and turned to the girls. The cashier was drooling embarrassingly, but didn't seem to notice. What can I get for you fine ladies? He asked, lasciviously. At the same time, both girls said, Mario! Thought so right away. He turned and quickly served them yogurt. As the group walked away from the counter, Keith glumly realized he was the only one who hadn't got any yogurt. But there didn't seem to be much he could do about it. Slightly ahead of him, Pam and Carrie chatted and giggled, but ignored Keith. Mario seemed generally calmer now that the girls were around, but when his eyes met Keith's, they glowed with hatred. Wait till you guys see what I bought, Pam said brightly as she reached into the department store bag she was carrying. This is the ultimate in TDF. With the flourish, she produced a long-sleeved red and green striped sweater from the bag. It was grimy and torn in places. You wouldn't believe the discount I got or what I had to do to get it. She winked at Mario. Then she held the sweater up to his chest. This is for you. Think it'll fit? Let's see. He quickly pulled it over his head. As he smoothed it out, the girls clapped. He nodded in grim satisfaction. Perfect. Uh, I don't know, Mario, Keith said. It doesn't look too good. Maybe you should take it back and get another one. Who asked you anyway? Mario snarled at him. I sure didn't. Don't know why I would. He advanced upon Keith, forcing him back. Look, you've been good for laughs, but frankly, we've only hung out with you out of pity. And that's old, dude. Real old. Keith was pinned up against the wall. But I think you're good for one more laugh. When I kill you, dude. Mario drew his head back and laughed. It was deep, cruel laughter, chilling. The girls joined him, but it was all the same sound. As it died down, Mario's face became a mask of pure hatred. Keith fled from the group. The mall lights flickered and then went out. The only light now came from occasional flashes of lightning from above. Come on with it, yelled Mario, not far behind. I take you out. I take you out right now. In the darkness, Keith soon lost his bearings. Tripping over a wire chain, he realized he was in the food court again. If Mel was still at the yogurt counter, maybe he could help. 
Keith started to stumble in what he hoped was that direction. Mel! He called out in a loud whisper. You gotta help me, Mel! Over here, man! Mel's voice seemed to come from just ahead. Keith ran toward the counter. A dark shape moved behind it. Mel? He asked tentatively. Yeah, it's me, man. What's up? It was Mel's voice, all right, but he still could not see the clerk's face. Help me, he pleaded. Mario's going to kill me. Calm down, Mel said soothingly. Have some yogurt, you'll feel better. I said Mario's trying to kill me. Keith was frantic. I know, I know, Mel laughed. It's all part of the act, right? Here, just have some yogurt. A yogurt cone floated out of the darkness. Confused, Keith reached for it. At the same time, lightning flashed, revealing the bony claw that held the cone, which was filled with dark red liquid. Keith looked up as lightning flashed again, enabling him to see a skeleton standing behind the counter, covered in gore, wearing a name tag that simply read Mel. Stringy hair framed a leering skull. Thunder boomed in the distance as blood began to gush from the yogurt dispensers. Mario can't hurt you now, the Mel thing cackled. The only thing he can do to you is give you a taste sensation. Then it brought the cone up to its teeth and poured the blood onto them. Terror froze Keith in place. As the skeleton slurped noisily at the bloody cone, a blue glow illuminated the yogurt stand. A grinding noise from one of the dispensers made Keith look up. Out of the top of one machine, Mario's limp, dead body twitched. As the grinding became louder, Mario began to disappear slowly into the dispenser. The machine was chewing him up, making him into yogurt. Keith screamed, but no sound came from his mouth. His attention riveted morbidly on the scene. Keith saw that beside Mario's corpse, now only visible from the shoulders up, Pam's body protruded from the neighboring yogurt machine. Like Mario, her body twitched and sank slowly, accompanied by the sickening grinding sounds. Keith shut his eyes against the horrifying image of his friends, but Carrie's voice made them snap open again. Keith, help! Carrie had appeared in the machine next to Pam, only she was alive. She struggled against the bony arms of Mel which were holding her down. The leering skull turned abruptly to Keith. You wanted Carrie all along. Let me make some for you. Fresh! Holding Carrie firmly with one skeletal arm, Mel reached with the other toward the button that would activate the yogurt machine. In an instant, Keith overcame his paralysis and leapt at the creature, hooking his fingers in its ribcage. Keith pulled back with all his might, hoping to tear the thing apart. It barely moved, but withdrew its hand from the button. Quickly, it plucked Keith's left hand away from itself and began to crush it in its claw. Bones splintered and crackled. Keith's bones. The Mel thing began to laugh. Don't fight it, man. I'm just trying to give good customer service. The skull nodded upward past Carrie, who was still struggling desperately. There was one more yogurt machine. It was empty, and Keith's name was etched on its surface. And it'll be my pleasure to serve you next. With that, the skeleton pushed Carrie violently backward, slamming her head against the inside wall of the machine. Her eyes fluttered and then closed. The claw, now free, reached for the button once more. Crumpled to the floor, his hands still in the creature's vice grip, Keith felt utterly helpless. He watched Mel depress the button. The grinding noise began immediately. He could hear it as his mind overloaded with pain and despair and he finally blacked out.
Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapters 3 and 4 of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Virtual Terror by David Bergantino. Gotta say, for being fairly early on in this book, and this book being a young adult novel, really enjoyed Chapter 4 there with the whole nightmare scape. But let's rewind for a second. Uh, I did enjoy the character development between Keith and Mario. Finding out a little backstory on Mario and a little backstory on Keith really helps, you know, flesh out the characters more in our mind. And, uh, you know, the decisions they're going to make over time is going to make more sense. Um, I love the fact that Mario is so good at wrestling because he's claustrophobic. And when he sees that claustrophobic time coming, he just says, nope, and uh, beats the crap out of the person and ends the match. That's fun. Um, of course, I used to be a pro wrestler, so amateur wrestling plays a part in that. So I'm always a fan of wrestling in general. So uh, kudos to you, uh, David Bergantino, for throwing in a little side story there uh, with wrestling. Uh, but it was also kind of sad to hear about Keith losing his dad at three. And then, you know, this other guy comes in, and he's like a con artist uh, that gets off on hurting people's feelings. But, again, kudos to David Bergantino, because finding out he was shot dead by one of the women that he did that to is just perfect karma. Uh, but for some reason, I have a feeling that that little tidbit about that guy is going to play a part later in the story, maybe in one of the nightmares or something. So I'm going to put my money down, bet that that's going to come back up sometime later in the book. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I am going to put my money on the table because I have a feeling that that little subplot is going to play a part in a nightmare or something later on in the book. We shall see, I guess. Again, if David's listening, he's probably, if, if I'm wrong, he's probably like, well, you're way off, Josh. Um, but yeah, so we get to chapter four. Oh, by the way, yes, uh, totally believable that they would have spent over four hours at the emergency room. I live in a fairly small town, fairly small county, a county full of small towns, and ER waits here are sometimes six, seven, eight hours. You know, it depends on what day. So, totally believable. That is a nightmare all its own. So, in a way, Chapter 3 had a nightmare, them having to wait at the ER uh, to find out his hand wasn't broke at all. But, uh, Chapter 4, we get the nightmare in the mall with uh, Mario putting on, you know, that the... Carrie and Pam had picked out a sweater. And, obviously, it was Freddy's sweater. I had some fun with this nightmare. I'm not sure what the characters were supposed to sound like, but what I want, what I felt like I should do is, like, use their voice, but make it like a nightmarish, Freddy-ish-esque voice for them. So I took the voice that I used for Mario, took the voice that I used for Mel, tried to just make it a little more gritty and kind of creepy-sounding, and put just like a little teeth, little tenth, little ten percent, maybe even like five percent, little Freddy sound to it, just a little bit, uh, to make a little nightmare sound for those characters. Because um, I've had nightmares like that before, and people's voices always sound warped and stuff, so that's what I was kind of going for. Uh, but I love, I love how this nightmare played out. Uh, you know, with the uh, skeleton, with the whole Freddy's uh, sweater and Mario, Mario saying, you've been good for a laugh, final laugh is going to be killing you, the whole thing with him running, getting back to Mel, who's working a yogurt stand instead of a poster uh, kiosk or whatever, um, you know, the whole skeletal thing, that was pretty, pretty good imagery there, but the fact that the flavors with the names and above, the actual people are being put into the machine, ground up to come out as the frozen yogurt. Very good imagery there. Perfect Freddy Krueger nightmare scape type of scenario. Really enjoyed that. Uh, very graphic for a young adult novel. So I was, I'm always pleasantly surprised by these uh, young adult slasher novels. Uh, you know, for really pushing the envelope on, you know, at least nowadays, would not fly. Um, but yeah, just picturing, you know, uh, two of his friends completely ground, grounded up into these machines, and then the third one, you know, like the love of his life or whatever, the one he's in love with, is still alive, and there's nothing you can do. And then all of a sudden, the skeletal demon demonic male thing has got a hold of him, and he blacks out. And then that's where I'm leaving us until the next installment, which will be very soon. But yeah, kind of on a little cliffhanger here. 
Uh, so, what's going to happen next? Let me know what you think, what you're looking forward to. Uh, let me know what you thought of these chapters tonight. If you agree that the whole, uh, you know, uh, thing, the subplot about his uh, mom's <clears throat> boyfriend after his dad died, you know, getting uh, was like a con artist, shyster, ended up getting killed by one of his past lovers. I just feel like that little story tidbit was given to us because it's going to play a part later. Do you think so? Or am I just uh, thinking too much into it? Who knows? Uh, let me know what you thought of the uh, nightmare scene here that David painted us in Chapter 4, because I personally really enjoyed it, but I'd love to hear what you thought as well. And I'll see you very soon with more of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Virtual Terror by David Bergantina. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian, saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and as always, pleasant dreams, bitch! See you next time.